Our New Testament reading is from John 1, verses 50 and 51. Jesus said, You believe because I told you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Our scripture lesson from the Old Testament today comes from the 27th and the 28th chapters of Genesis. Listen now to God's word for us. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called his elder son Esau and said to him, my son. And he answered, here I am. He said, see, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out into the field and hunt game for me. Then prepare for me savory food, such as I like, and bring it to me to eat, so that I may bless you before I die. Then Rebekah took the best garments of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. And she put the skins of the kids on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she handed the savory food and the bread she had prepared to her son Jacob. So he went in to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now, now sit up and eat of my game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near, that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went up to his father Isaac, who felt him, and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, because his hands were hairy, like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night, because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place, and he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We've been spending time together in God's story, beginning in the beginning, and learning from Genesis about all the stories in the Bible, and how they're all one big story, about how they tell the story of a God who loves us and calls us back to him. It's an adventure story. It's a comedy at times. It's certainly a drama, too. It's everything that you've loved in stories for your whole life. And the best thing is, it's true. Because not everything is true. We know this. 
As for what's on TV and the internet, what's being claimed from this politician or that one, it's exhausting. And a lot of it just isn't true. But those lies get out there because they make us feel better about ourselves or our opinions, or they're part of an effort to get others to think like us. I don't think that's a mystery. So I have a thing about lying. I really, really, really try not to. Uh, But I was thinking about that this week. And I realized I do tell lies. Because have you ever tried to live with a kid? (laughs) I saw these confessions in an article about the little fibs we tell our kids. I tell my kids when the ice cream truck plays its song, it's because it's out of ice cream. I have my five-year-old, seven-year-old, and eight-year-old stepdaughter convinced the smoke detectors are actually Santa cams. He's always watching in every room. And one mom says, when my three-year-old's betta fish died, I took her to the pet section at Walmart. I pointed to a similar fish and said, what's Troy doing here? Come on, Troy, we're taking you back home. You got to do what you got to do sometimes. But there's another lie that we tell. Do you remember this one? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yeah, that's a lie. A big one. But we'll get to that. Today we're talking about Jacob. In many ways, Jacob's an easy guy to relate to. He's definitely not a saint. He makes some pretty big mistakes. He's pretty devious. Ultimately, we call him a hero of the faith. It's almost as though he would fit right in on one of those one-hour nighttime dramas, like Law and Order or something. He is the most unheroic hero you're going to find. Definitely flawed, but someone whose story strikes a chord within us. So we need to know what's happening in Genesis. Now, we could talk about this for hours. We won't, but we could. There are two main parts. The first 12 chapters, when God creates us, it's good, and then it spirals downward from there until God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to save the world through your family. Teach your family my ways. We'll create a new community, a new nation of peace, and someday out of your family will come the Messiah. And so every generation after that has one child, right, to bear that messianic seed, that line, to pass the faith on until it blooms in the King of Kings. Last week we went Abraham to Isaac. This week it's Isaac to Jacob. Jacob is Isaac's son, though not his only son. There's a whole lot of history uh, and technical stuff about birth order for the Hebrew people, but suffice it to say, being the oldest is a pretty great deal. Esau was the oldest by like a minute. They were twins. The Talmud, some Jewish writings for teaching that kind of tell extra stories about people in the scriptures, written afterward. Um, The Talmud says that while they were in the womb, every time Rebekah passed a synagogue or a holy place, Esau would try to get out. And every time they passed somewhere that was overrun with sin, Jacob would try and climb out of the womb. Suffice it to say, there was a good bit of competition among the brothers, for Isaac's attention. And Jacob was not the favorite son. Not of his father. That was Esau. The man's man. The hunter. Jacob was more what they call indoorsy. So, short version is Isaac sends Esau out to hunt so they could share a meal together. And after that meal, Isaac is going to give Esau the the blessing, the blessing, the head seat in the family. Rebekah takes the chance to help Jacob deceive his father. She tells Jacob to put on his brother's clothes, wrap his hands in, in goat fur to be hairy like his brother, 
And Jacob, he's scared. We didn't read this part, but Jacob asks her, what if he finds out and curses me? And Rebecca says something that reverberates. Then let the curse fall on me. I will take the curse so that you could have the blessing. And Isaac, blind in his old age, asks him straight out, Who are you? What's your name? And Jacob says, Esau, your firstborn. He, he was lying. <laughs> he really believed. He wanted to be the firstborn, but he wasn't Esau. But Isaac conveys the blessing. Now, what's the blessing? We use that word all the time, right? But it's not necessarily the same as what we see in the Scriptures. Because Rebecca and Jacob knew that this wasn't going to turn out great, right? I mean, they knew Esau had to come back at some point. But it's a blessing that is something that Rebecca and Jacob thought could be stolen. It's not, we would never think of a blessing to be something that you could steal. But for them, it was something that Isaac and Esau thought really was taken. See, you got to ask yourself, at least I did, why couldn't Isaac, after he realized what had happened, just say, hey, I take that back? What's the blessing? It's a legal thing, the rights to be the head of the clan, but it's more. If you keep going... When Esau then went to Isaac and said, hey, this is not cool, bless me too. Isaac says, I can't do that. Because words don't come back, do they? One of the commentaries says, this narrative presumes that symbolic actions have genuine and abiding power. And that spoken words, especially to a child, shape human life. Words are not a matter of indifference. In other words, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a lie. I've heard it better as sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can break my soul. You know. Because you remember. Even off-handed comments that have been made to you over the years. Words of affirmation and blessing, but words of condemnation and cursing have moved into your life and they're still operating there like they're a power. They are still in there programming how you feel about yourself for good or bad. They shape who you are. And if even offhand stuff can pass into you and hurt you or lift you up for years and years and years in your memory, how much more words from this sort of a climax, from the sort of moment like your father's deathbed blessing? Have you ever really been blessed like that? I hope so. It's not a surface-level blessing. Thanks for everything. You're great. It's deeper. It's when someone looks deep into who you are and choosing powerful gestures and words. They affirm and encourage and empower that person toward being who they are meant to be. Isaac was giving Jacob words of affirmation, making him somebody, giving him a hope that he might be something. And we need this. Nobody can bless themselves. No matter how much Oprah or Dr. Phil you watch, blessing is from the outside. It's not found in a self-help book or a warm feeling. A smart person tells you you're smart. A good person tells you you're good. Blessing is when someone who is uniquely valuable to you says that you have 
unique value. Jacob makes his pitch. I can do it. I can be your firstborn. I'm the one you should have been loving all these years. Smile on me. Bless me, Dad. We all want the blessing of the firstborn, don't we? We want the persons we most admire in the world to look at us and say, there's nobody like you. You're special. Jacob is actually a frightening picture of how most of us try and get blessing. We dress up like someone we are not. We think we have to. Jacob puts on Esau's clothes, makes himself hairy, probably lowered his voice. It didn't work. To get blessing, he couldn't be himself. He hid. Are we doing that? Are we not letting people see who we are? Not letting people see the flaws and the weaknesses? We take jobs for the status. We pursue relationships for what someone could give us. We try to find value for ourselves through the value we see in other people. What do you put on for others to see? How much of your time are you investing in that persona? Or maybe you say, that's not me. I don't need their approval. I don't want their blessing. I don't care what they think of me. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I don't care what they think of me. Then why are you so mad about it? The lack of blessing from others is painful. One of the ways we get blessing is come to church, right? Come to Sunday school. Dress up like somebody without too many problems. The right kind of problems, of course. Dress up like someone without too many fears or too many temptations because we want other people to say we are special. It doesn't work, you know. Because as Jacob gets these words from Isaac's lips, he always wanted to hear. When he sees the look on his father's face that he always wanted to see, do you think anything changed for Jacob? No. It didn't change him. Why? Because he knew it wasn't him that Isaac was blessing. How bitter it must have been to get that close to having your father love you. And you know it's not you he's talking to because you're dressed up. You're putting on persona. Here's the thing. When you are not being yourself, when you are trying to hide who you are, all the compliments in the world aren't going to do a darn thing to fill the hole in your life. Because those compliments you know are not for the real you, are they? And what's more, all that deceit It ruins everybody's life. Jacob's got to leave because Esau wants to kill him. Esau's life is consumed by anger. Rebecca loses the one person she was closest to and dies without ever seeing Jacob again. Jacob spends his entire life trying to find blessing. Keep reading in Genesis. You'll see he actually ends up wrestling God over the same thing. So here we go. What's the moral of the story? Well, one's pretty obvious. Parents... Be better parents than this. But that's not all. Because a lot of us are already out of families. And we're already screwed up. We're just as needy as Jacob. See, even those of us blessed with good families are still like Jacob. Bad parenting makes it worse. Good parenting makes it better. But we're still looking for blessing. We still wander around like, Like we're little kids. Bless me. But more than that, it's about God. It's not about us. Isaac realizes it was Jacob. He gets a little mad about it, of course. But then he says, but indeed, he will be blessed. Because God will work through everyone. 
failures and flops and fools. Everyone who is unworthy. There's no doubt Esau is more likable. But God still finds a way to give grace to a man who is about as terrible as it gets. He never does anything that's a good example, really. Not even when he leaves. God brings grace into the lives of people who don't seek it, who don't deserve it, who might even resist it and certainly don't appreciate it. But God does it anyway. Because Jacob was wrong when he said, I'm the firstborn. Scriptures say that Jesus Christ was the firstborn of all creation living for all eternity with firstborn blessing, with love poured into his heart, overflowing, that we can hardly imagine. And Jesus left that firstborn blessing behind and came to die. You know, when Jesus talks to God in the Scripture, it's always Father, uh, Abba, nearly all the time. But there is one time that he doesn't. On the cross, he says, God. Because on the cross, crying, my God, why have you forsaken me? He lost the firstborn's blessing. Like Rebecca said, let the curse be on me. Jesus became a curse for us. So that the blessing that was promised to Abraham might come to us through him. The way of the gospel is that Jesus Christ dressed up as you and got the curse you deserved. And when I believe in Jesus Christ, I get the firstborn blessing. Because we are a church of the firstborn. It's in the book of Hebrews. In the family of God, the love we experience when we stand in Christ can make us feel that we are the only one in the world, beloved of our Father. Jacob has to leave because Esau's going to kill him. So he has to get out in the middle of nowhere before he realizes what he has never actually realized before is that God is with him wherever he goes. God is there. And in this, he receives God's blessing. The Lord speaks to him. The blessing promised to Abraham. The Lord is with him. And all he can say is, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Sure it is. What he doesn't see is, it always has been. Grace is ours. You don't need to wear anyone else's clothes. Just be who you are. Because it's then that the Holy Spirit will let, will let you hear what you've always wanted to hear. Words he spoke to his son. This is my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. A blessing. Because sticks and stones may break my bones, but God loves and died to save me. Amen.